Welcome back, everyone, after coffee. My, coffee. my name is Dominic Warre. Um, thank you for the introduction, Francis. Thank you for a fabulous beginning to um, um, the Red Exchange for 2016. What a brilliant, brilliant start. Um, thank you to Norway um, and to the other kind sponsors of the uh, meeting. Um, I work for the World Economic Forum. It's the international organization for public-private cooperation. So in terms of the thrust of this discussion, which is about kind of alliance building, international collaboration to help support the delivery um, of Red Plus at a national um, or sub-national level, delighted to see what we can build from this. Many of you have worked with us um, over the course of the last three or four years in this incredible sea change, I would argue, um, that has taken us from Copenhagen through to Paris and the rise of a different kind of momentum, perhaps, um, in this agenda, building on and complementing the Red Plus architecture with these alliances and commitments and new collaborations and new funding mechanisms, which I think collectively we feel has given a burst of momentum um, into the agenda. And it's my delight to have such a fabulous uh, panel to kind of explore what that means um, not only historically, but more importantly, through to 2018, when there's this important review period, and then 2020. Um, we have, and I'll introduce them shortly, but um, representatives from um, our kind of uh, donor governments, from our international community, from um, leadership at the state and province level, from indigenous people's alliances, and from the private sector. So we absolutely have the gamut of the collaboration and the alliance build that we seek to explore, and uh, with your help and patience, um, that's what we aim to do. So with no further ado, um, I'll get on and introduce our panel uh, briefly, um, and then we'll start the conversation. So um, to my left um, is uh, Thomas um, Sieberhorn, Sieberhorn, who is the Parliamentary State Secretary for the Federal Minister of Economic Cooperation and Development in Germany. He's been in that job since 2014, so all the way through the Climate Summit, I am sure, and beyond, so we're looking very much forward to your contributions and thoughts on the uh, Red Plus agenda and the commitment that was made in Paris and what you hope to see uh, next. Uh, to Thomas's uh, left is Naiko Ishii, who is the chairperson and CEO and president and all-round driver of the Global Environment Facility and has arguably reinvented that facility to have a strong focus on the global commons. Um, and we'd be very interested to hear your viewpoints, uh, Dr. Ishii, on uh, how you see the role of a multilateral organization uh, like the GEF helping to promote and support the Red Plus agenda. Um, to uh, Naiko Ishii's uh, left is uh, Dr. Victor Noriega, uh, who is the governor of San Martin province in Peru. And for those of you who studied your geography carefully and looked at your app, before you came here, you'll know that um, uh, the governor is one of the leaders in these alliances of um, forests and climate governors uh, groups and has a state that has enormous amounts of challenges to do with deforestation and levels of poverty. So this development forest production protection agenda is alive and well um, in the governor's state, but is also one of the innovators um, and leading um, the change process. So we're going to be very interested to hear um, from, from the governor. Um, to the governor's left um, is um, Hindu Ibrahim, um, who is a leader, as you well know, many of you um, in the audience of indigenous peoples, alliances and groups, particularly from the African chapter, and played a key role uh, through the Paris negotiations and now into implementation of ensuring that indigenous peoples are part of these alliance bills. And so we'll be very keen to hear from you, Hindu, as to how you would like to see um, these public-private partnerships, which are often kind of termed in that way, to actually have the C in the I, the civil society, the C in the S, the indigenous peoples groups in there, fully front and center, and how you think that should work best and what we should do to drive that forward. Um, finally, um, to uh, Hindu's uh, left um, is Jonathan Horrell, who is the uh, Director of Sustainability at Mondelez International. Um, and Jonathan um, has been at the center of building and driving um, and creating some of these uh, company commitments and supply chain innovations and partnerships on the ground um, uh, that we've been hearing about in those first slides. So we'd be very interested to hear kind of why 
uh, Mondelez International is, is in this space and what your experiences have been to date and again, in that spirit of moving forward, what your advice uh, would be about how we build very practical actions that can take account of the uh, funding from Red Plus. So that's the scenery for the conversation. Um, after that first round of questions, um, then what we'll do, um, panelists, is because you absolutely represent the full sweep here, um, I'd like you to think about what you'd like to ask each other um, because it's a partnership equation. Um, and so um, what might you, Hindu, like to see of the GEF? Jonathan, what would you like to see from the Red Plus architecture? Um, Governor, what would like you like to see from any of the above? Um, and so you know, what would you like to see in terms of partnerships that can deliver the results that you seek for you and the taxpayers in Germany on the, on the Red Plus agenda? So have a think about that um, as we go through the first um, range of questions. But let's start. Um, and let's start with um, um, you, um, Mr. Sieberhorn. Um, so um, perhaps um, from your perspective, um, you can tell us a little bit about uh, where you see now post Paris and after that fabulous kind of commitment of $5 billion, the kind of red plus agenda uh, moving forward. What are the opportunities and what do you see as some of the risks to delivering against those opportunities? Thank you. Well, thank you. First, it's a pleasure to be here and to discuss with you our next steps forward. What we need from our point of view is a strong political will, as always in politics and in particular in development politics. We need strong partnerships, including donor and forest countries, including civil society, businesses and uh, governments. And we need more and better coordinated finance. With respect to political will, I would say we have to clarify our narratives. From a international perspective, we stress very much this idea of using forests as carbon sinks. From the perspective of uh, indigenous people, we heard for them it's a question of survival. And this might be a different narrative and it's useful from my point of view to, to have all these different approaches and to convene those ideas to our joint goal to achieve our climate goals. And in the end, it's a question of survival of humankind, but it's also a question of survival of societies in forest countries. And that's where um, sustainable land and forest management comes in, and we need uh, partnerships to foster this idea of sustainable management. This idea is not entirely new. In Germany, we use it for more than 150 years, and in Norway too, you find many industrialized countries focused on sustainable forest management for decades already. So this showcases it works. It works under the condition of industrialized countries, including private businesses. And this means it's also a business case. You can manage your forest in a way that it is profitable in the long run. And if it's not sustainably managed, it will not be profitable in the long run. So indeed, we have here again the question of survival, not only of our forests, of our livelihoods. And uh, the ownership of our partner countries comes in, in this understanding of how to manage our forests in a way that it can be kept for generations. And if this is not done, uh, forest countries deprive their societies from their livelihood. And this might be seen in years only, but already today you can observe mm. the severe impacts of extreme weather events, droughts and floods, in the Horn of Africa, in parts of Latin America. So we already experience the impacts of non-sustainable forest and land management systems. And that's why we have to make this paradigm shift now. And the agenda of uh, uh, the United Nations, Agenda 2030 for Sustainable Development, and uh, the Paris Climate Agreement uh, are now uh, at the right time uh, giving the direction to organize such a paradigm shift. And um, in the spirit of partnership, 
created by the Agenda 2030. We should really strive for including all the relevant stakeholders to learn from each other and uh, to bring in our experiences. So what I said from uh, sustainable forest management in Germany or Norway will not be able to be exported to other countries because things are different. And uh, it, it's not so easy that uh, we can just replicate what has been successful elsewhere. So we have to find adopted, adapted solutions for each country. And that's why we also from industrialized countries have to learn from each other. And we have most inspiring projects, for example, in Chad, in Ethiopia, where planting trees um, um, uh, uh, leads to, um, uh, to bring back uh, groundwater to refill water stores and to um, rehabilitate even agriculture, um, but not in a way in which uh, forest management is done in Europe. Uh, it's not the same trees, not the same plants. So we have to do it adapted to the solutions. And when it comes to finance, uh, we uh, already uh, did a lot with the uh, Red Exchange, we have, uh, the Red Plus program. Uh, for, we had a, have an early mover program. Uh, we are cooperating very closely with uh, Norway and UK and I'm glad to announce here that uh, the German federal government will provide an additional 50 million euros for uh, the forest carbon partnership facility of the World Bank group and thus bring our uh, commitment in total to 200 million euros. We want to use this money in a way that we can bring in more partner countries to step in to our joint efforts. And of course, we are uh, committed to measure what uh, the results will be. And uh, this could be a chance also for creating political awareness because we have also always to, um, uh, to argue in our, in front, in, in our public uh, for which purposes we spend our money and whether this money is uh, spent uh, in an effective way. And it's very hard in development policy to, to measure what has not occurred. So it's hard to argue why it's useful to invest in conflict prevention because you, ca cannot, you cannot show the conflicts that did not occur. Mm. Uh, often you know only afterwards, in negative cases, you see it would have been better to act preventively. And so prevention is um, a core issue in development policy, to act early enough and decisively enough. This is uh, crucial. And that's why um, conservation of forests is, um, in this respect, a good example, because we can really measure the results in terms of uh, carbon emissions, but also in uh, terms of uh, uh, satellite pictures. Mm -hmm. So you can show at each square meter around the world how the forests, uh, uh, how we proceed in uh, preventing from deforestation or investing in reforestation. And in the end, we are only successful. Sustainable forest management is only effective if deforestation does in no way exceed reforestation. So we will have clear results on our policies. It's wonderful. So if you're tweeting, you should tweet that. There was your announcement. I think we should have a round of applause for Germany. 50 million, dollars, 50 million euros into the fund. Thank you very much. If I could just ask as a sort of follow-on, because it was a very interesting comment that you made um, about the, um, the domestic audience, if you like, um, because you know, this is taxpayers' money. Um, and, you know, you've been at the center of the architecture of, of building the Red Plus um, since, uh, since 2014 and, and, and such. D d do, are you comfortable? Does this move towards a sort of more public and private alliance building space? You know, some of the companies getting involved. That, that's, that's good. That, that helps to deliver more value for um, the, the funds that you're putting in. Or does it feel um, like it's, uh, you know, evolving the agenda away from the, the pure aid um, that you want to provide to developing countries. I'm interested in your, in, in your read for that, because that seems to be where the agenda is yeah. evolving. 
Well, I think the clear message of uh, the Agenda 2030 is that this ambitious set of goals will not be achieved by public money only. Mm -hmm. So we will have to include private finance. And on the other hand, there are so many companies investing in developing countries, so-called developing countries, that we should have a public interest uh, that this private money is invested in a way that supports our sustainable development oh, goals. Otherwise, uh, we would uh, paralyze our efforts by, by taxpayers' money. So in, in both directions, we should be interested in uh, a close cooperation with the private sector. That's fabulous. That's such a good insight, actually, about the strategic way that you can use um, limited public money to actually kind of create the best out of the partnership um, yeah. with, the, with the private sector in the space. Thank you. Um, we'll probably come back in the, in the conversation. But Dr. Ishii, um, uh, so looking at the kind of the, the overarching kind of uh, agenda from the uh, perspective that, that you see, you have the 2015 to 2030 agenda on the SDGs, we have the Paris Agreement, um, and you are um, forging this <coughs> narrative of the, of the global commons and how we must protect them. Um, within all of that, how do you see this agenda of um, not only the, the, the forest sort of production protection uh, 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 initiatives, but also utilizing the architecture of Red Plus. How do you, how do you bring these pieces together from your perspective? Because you're sitting at the apex of this multilateral architecture. Thank you, Dominique, and thank you, everyone. Uh, just at, at the outset, I just want to congratulate Norwegian government and Norwegian people uh, for your leadership of this uh, forest sector. And uh, you create this uh, best practice uh, of um, delivering uh, this assistance for two things. Major commitment for longer term, which made the uh, uh, engagement much easier, and also linking up the money with results, which is politically very, very difficult thing, but very well done. So that I just want to congratulate and would like to thank uh, your leadership. Then move on to, Dominique, your big question about <laughs> <laughs> fact we try. this post-2015 give us and how we want to utilize it. I think that the post-2015 give us three important entry points. Uh, number one, Thomas, you mentioned that narrative. One narrative which um, um, this framework gives us is a global movement for global commons. The one common narrative, the message from those two uh, global agreements is the importance of the health of global commons global environmental commons, our ocean, our land, our water, and the climate, and our forest. And without health of those global commons, there would be no future development, no sustainable development, and uh, us and people. So this is the kind of narrative this post-2015 give us, how we can utilize this narrative to create more shared um, a platform. Uh, that's one. The second entry point of this use of this in the 2015 is a commitment uh, from a national and also local community. Both of the commitments, it's not just the top down, but it comes from also the local community. So how we can utilize this commitment, not only national, but local, and, and strengthening this narrative. So this is a second um, entry point. And but the last, but maybe most interesting, and maybe relevant to this particular session, is this a uh, boost of uh, our interest of this multi-stakeholder platform approach. Uh, up to the Paris um, COP, we have witnessed this mushrooming, this uh, um, creation or strengthening of multi-stakeholder platform approach. And it kind of confirmed us, yeah, we need this new platform to, to, to achieve uh, this sustainable development goal and to achieve this climate goal. So how we can actually strengthen uh, this multi-stakeholder platform. And what's new to this platform is, it's not only just the national local government, uh, but also that the finance and the business and the indigenous local community. Um, and along that the very particular concrete theme, so it's not just something abstract, it's quite, it's created along this 
critical theme could be PP, you already mentioned this forest, protective, productive, public private partnership. That's the word I'm learning, P5. So it's very yeah. unique, but very interesting multi stakeholder platform uh, for forest. Uh, we have been also talking about uh, how to create this kind of platform for marine um, that trust or marine data. Uh, there are and energy efficiencies, and renewable energy, a lot of important multi stakeholder platforms are happening or are coming uh, to, to pass. But to, to this particular session with the forest, I just want to mention maybe two things which we have been doing together with, with many of you. Uh, the one is that then how to strengthen the platform of uh, supply chain of global commodity. We all know 80% of the forest loss comes from just the three global commodities, soy and beef and palm oil. The previous session already talked about that then in case of Indonesia, in case of uh, Colombia. Um, how we could strengthen this multi-stakeholder platform along this supply chain, so how we can uh, arrest the deforestation, but also more maybe interestingly, how we could bring this angle of sustainable development, how we could provide that and a livelihood for local community, how we could strengthen the power of the authority of um, the state and the local government. So how we could bring those uh, key elements together towards the shared vision. Now that's one thing that we have been working, and uh, there our role is that and what is the weakest point of this multi-stakeholder platform mm -hmm. approach? Is this a uh, contribution or the indigenous people, or is this on how to strengthen that the, uh, accounting uh, system, or your forest code, or is this more like a uh, risk capital from private sector? So our role, like a public institution, the particularly GF is more like a grant-making institution, is trying to find out what's missing from this uh, multi-stakeholder platform oh, okay. going forward. Last example is Amazon. That the here, because we have Peruvian government, and we in the previous government uh, panel we have Colombia. One of the pro program we are promoting is Amazon. This is a new vision of Amazon. It's not just an protection. It's more like a productive use of the Amazon, but including local community, indigenous people, and the private sector. And it's very historical. If you are working on the Amazon you may know politically how challenging to bring neighboring Amazon countries together towards the shared vision. So this is actually another program, how we could help those neighboring countries from national government to state government to local community, including indigenous people, together moving forward. Fabulous, very interesting. So. <clears throat> If um, Thomas said there's a very interesting kind of strategic direction of you know how one can use some of the public money, those new commitments um, uh, into Red Plus to ensure that these partnerships go in the right direction, um, you're suggesting that we have a new um, uh, acronym P5, which if you're involved in the UN Secretary General um, uh, voting process, it's not your P5, it's another P5: Production and Protection Public Private Partnership P5. You heard it here first. Um, and that is a kind of a, a landscape that you would kind of use um, to see where in these kind of global supply chains there are areas of weakness, um, where concessional finance and support, technical assistance from programs that the GEF can provide can bolster um, and drive forward some of the intent that the Red Plus architecture might be looking at. Very interesting. And is, do you said it, from your term at the GEF, is that... Do you feel this is like a new agenda, um, that things are accelerating, that you're, you're, you're breaking new ground here? Um, or has um, a lot of the work already been done and you're just sort of filling in with finance, but people have identified the answers already? Well, very interesting question. I have been thinking exactly the same question last night. And <laughs> <laughs> GF, <laughs> GF has provided already 400 projects, 2.1 billion uh, for the last um, 25 years since we were born. But my question for you, Dominic, and for everybody is those 400 projects, 2.5 billion, really adding up and to transform this forest sector for sustainable development. Well, we are having very good projects, success story, nice story here and there, but in a sense, it's a bit fragmented. Oh. So what we need is to really bring 
everybody's contribution or strength together to actually transform, to, to revolutionize this forest sector. So that then, yes, there are quite a good and a work here and there about this 400 project. I think we have prepared a lot of groundwork for new vision, new REDD plus works that then a lot of accounting work, legislative work, the strength in the indigenous and the people's contribution. But this is really the time to bring those and the forces together towards the shared vision. What is maybe really missing is to break silo and to have a big vision, but also how to bring the private sector. That is a bit of the missing link so far. And how the institution like us can actually provide risk capital, more clarity, simplicity, and mm. the predictability, so that the, this nice vision is not only just a vision, but to, to, to leverage the private sector in. That may be the, may be the most vulnerable missing link so far. Hmm. Oh, that's very interesting. So here's a sort of strategic journey from, I mean, you've got some excellent projects, a wonderful portfolio, but what systemically mm. Um, is the lean in from the GF? Maybe it's on risk capital. Maybe it's on including um, key uh, actors in the space who haven't yet been in included. Um, Governor Noriego, and, uh, you might want to put on your. If you don't speak Spanish, you might want to put on your your your, your headphones while I ask the question, so that when um, Governor answers, we're not all busy trying to catch up with the excellent answer that that he'll provide. Um, so, um, Governor Noriega, you're, you're kind of um, at the. Um, center of this debate. You run a province, um, you face these challenges, you see development and deforestation side by side, you receive um, Red Plus support, um, people like the GEF want to help you, you have companies and other private sector organizations in the state, and you are you know, a member and a leader um, of the um, uh, Governor's Climate and Forest Task Force. So I think we'd be so interested to hear from you how you see this agenda right now and what you see needs to happen next to meet the protection and the production at a jurisdictional level at a state like you own. Thank you. Gracias, Dominic. Eh, un agradecimiento a los organizadores, gracias Noruega por tenernos acá y a todos los presentes. Realmente el grupo de trabajo de gobernadores sobre clima y bosques del Perú, conformada por Amazonas, Loreto, Ucayali, San Martín, Madre de Dios, que son integrantes del Consejo Interregional Amazónico. Tenemos un gran compromiso y estamos haciendo un gran esfuerzo con el apoyo de GCF para generar una política dentro de nuestras regiones de, de compromiso sobre lo que es el desarrollo del medio ambiente. Toda vez que antes pues, estaba prácticamente abandonada y a merced de los grandes depredadores. A su vez, GCF también ha ayudado a, a relacionarnos con otros estados y provincias, como por ejemplo Brasil, España, Indonesia, Nigeria, Estados Unidos y el Perú. Estamos haciendo realmente grandes esfuerzos para disminuir lo que es la emisión del gas invernadero como producto de la deforestación y de la degradación de nuestros suelos. Consideramos que tenemos que unirnos todos. Tenemos que trabajar juntos, trabajamos juntos, ganamos juntos. No es solamente responsabilidad de la cooperación internacional, no es solamente de los gobiernos nacionales o gobiernos subnacionales o de la inversión privada, es de todos juntos, todos tenemos que involucrarnos. Hay algunas urgencias y necesidades que tiene, que tenemos como gobierno subnacional. Fortalecer la articulación del trabajo entre los gobiernos nacionales y los gobiernos subnacionales. Necesitamos que el financiamiento 
que llega a los gobiernos, pues pueda aterrizar hacia la población objetivo y no se quede solamente en un nivel nacional. De esa manera podemos conseguir una transformación y un desarrollo sostenible. No solamente es cuestión de una política técnica del Estado, tenemos que tener en cuenta también el aspecto social. No pretendamos tener un desarrollo sostenible si es que no le damos a nuestra población de comunidades indígenas, a nuestra población civil, el cómo vivir, el cómo tener un buen vivir. Un ejemplo práctico en el Perú y en la región San Martín, que es una región donde el narcotráfico ha sido uno de los grandes males que le aquejaba. Dentro de ello teníamos una provincia de Tocache, que era el centro del narcotráfico en el Perú. Pero gracias a que a esa población se le ha dado una alternativa, como por ejemplo el cultivo del cacao, que ha logrado revertir esa situación, esa población vive en mejores condiciones y ha logrado que el cacao de San Martín sea el, el mejor cacao del mundo. Necesitamos de la inversión privada para transformar este producto primario, dar el valor agregado y también necesitamos de la inversión privada para comprar esos productos. Y en eso pediríamos a la comunidad internacional que se le debe dar un plus a ese producto, de esa manera puede llegar hacia esa población. Entonces, esa población hoy en día prefiere dedicarse a lo que es a un cultivo lícito y que en cierta forma ha mejorado sus condiciones. De igual forma, la deforestación también es uno de los grandes males que tienen nuestros tiempos. Se puede aplicar el mismo principio, pero para eso necesitamos que todos conjuguemos esfuerzos para poder hacer llegar realmente ese presupuesto, no solamente decirle qué hacer, sino cómo hacerlo. Y es el compromiso de todos nosotros. Trabajamos juntos, ganamos juntos. Governor, thank you so much um, for that. That was very, very interesting um, indeed. Um, two things spring to mind. First of all, thank you for um, creating the very important development context within which the deforestation uh, agenda plays out. Um, that, was, that was very, very compelling. Secondly, I'm not suggesting that we're going to cut new trade deals on this panel, but if your province has the world's best cocoa and you have one of the world's largest uh, 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 purchasers of cocoa down the end of the, uh, the panel here, who's for me to say? <laughs> but watch them in the coffee break. Um, but, but, but seriously, it's actually a very, very important point, I think, that you raise, if I hear you correctly, that this production and protection can go hand in hand and with smart use of public money to perhaps find premium prices for sustainably sourced product, we somehow connections can be made um, to um, uh, those who might purchase those commodities which benefit um, the indigenous peoples who otherwise were in a, a not very good developmental space, if I, if I hear you correctly. So I guess my follow-up question, if I can, Governor, is... Um, you, it sounds like you're supportive of this um, emerging new agenda of the public and the private and the civil society working together to fix this problem and being innovative in the money that can be found from the Red Plus architecture or the GEF or indeed from the private sector. Would that be a fair statement? Sí. Sí, lo que nosotros necesitamos, no solamente vamos a estar esperanzados en el financiamiento público. La inversión privada es importantísimo. La inversión privada, pero una inversión privada con rostro social. Una inversión privada 
que busque el desarrollo económico productivo y busque el desarrollo del medio ambiente. En esas condiciones, en armonía con el medio ambiente, tranquilamente podemos nosotros buscar esa sostenibilidad en el crecimiento de nuestras economías y lo más importante, llegar ese buen vivir para todos y para todas. En, en el Perú lo que necesitamos es, por ejemplo, de la inversión privada, de la cooperación internacional, que nos ayuden a tecnificar la agricultura. No queremos más hectáreas de cultivo, lo que queremos de lo que tenemos es incrementar la productividad para hacerle más rentable. Tenemos otras cadenas de valor que nos gustaría y necesariamente impulsar para de esta manera poder satisfacer las necesidades de nuestra población. En, con respecto a un, nosotros tenemos comunidades indígenas en, en el Perú y en, especialmente en la región San Martín. Y una cadena de valor que va en armonía con el medio ambiente es desarrollamos con ellos planes de vida y dentro de los planes de vida una cadena de valor que es la apicultura, la producción de miel de abeja, que tranquilamente es sostenible y le damos a esa comunidad indígena una economía que le permite satisfacer. Cosas como esas debemos desarrollar a nivel de nuestras regiones, de nuestro país y a nivel mundial. Governor, thank you very much indeed for that. Um, I'm now reminded, Francis, of the jigsaw um, metaphor that you gave me. It's, it's, it's we do have the outsides and you can feel, I mean, it wasn't um, planned, but the conversation is fascinating. You can feel that we're reaching for how these pieces start to connect together in, in, in the middle um, of that jigsaw. Hindu Ibrahim, um, you know, this is, I mean, you've been such a fabulous um, leader for, on the indigenous people's uh, rights and inclusion um, in the Red Plus agenda and many other aspects um, through Paris and beyond. And, and here you just heard from, from the governor, albeit in a different region of the world, but the need for sort of socially appropriate investment, the, the, the civil society bit in the public-private um, partnership. So I guess my question um, um, to you is, um, from um, an indigenous peoples uh, leader, do you also um, um, uh, follow this um, uh, uh, agenda that is being set out, that actually we need the public and the private, we need investment, but it's investment for the, for the local people and for that development as well as the, as well as the protection of the resource? And if, if that's true, um, what do you see that we need to do next to take that forward, perhaps particularly from, from your part of the of the world, the West African context. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dominique, and thank you for the organizer. Of course, the uh, SDG Paris Agreement is very important for us as international level, but this Oslo Red Plus is really important, especially in this time of implementation. So keep it up. Also, are we are keeping the next of the international uh, agenda. And thank you for the good time, because for the people like me, when you do that in winter, I'm not sure to be able to be here and talk. <laughs> I'm coming from very hot. So that's one of the contests that we really need to, need to meet up. Uh, actually, as indigenous peoples, as all of them said, it's very important for us to have the partnership, especially this time, because it's going to global level. So then we did that, thank you for Peru, France, and uh, the UN who put together the Lima Paris Action Agenda. That was like the first platform when they asked, hey, indigenous peoples, you wanna get also with us in the board because you are doing the work and we feel yes, why not? So since uh, New York declaration where indigenous peoples come with some government, with the UN and with the private sector saying yes, we are keeping the forest. And for us, forest is as my previous indigenous colleagues said, it's not about money. It's about our life, our survival. It's about our identity because it's our home then we are not protected for someone, we are protected for us. And we are asking the others to protect it for us. So that's why for us the partnership is really welcome because it's 
asking the others to commit in what we are doing, then it's very important to see what, which level this commitment will take. If we come from the private sector, from the government, from the UN agencies, everyone have his own objective firstly, mm -hmm. and the second plan, maybe we can put how we can come at, as alliance. So we have to follow something. This is the implementation of what we took as commitment. We have the safeguard on Red Plus. We have the safeguard on environmental issues and the socials. And we do have another dimension as the indigenous people's declaration who is adopted. And we have the FP. So all these international agreements, we are still having them, like Paris Agreement, the SDG, the others. So we need the implementation of it. Then coming all together can help the implementation correctly of those agreements and to protect our right. Because for us, it's very important to think beyond just the red as trees, beyond the red as money, beyond the red as business or power, but it's people. And people meaning all of us on the planet. So we need to keep it healthy. So that's how we are seeing the collaboration or the partnership among all the, the different stakeholders. And when we talk about the partnership also, for us it's important to see the different fragmentation of this partnership. We talking about the gender issues, but how we can put the women, as indigenous women, part of the bigger player for the environment protections in this one. And I think each of us need to see it in the different angle, not having indigenous peoples or women are photos. Excuse me to say that, because like saying uh, we have all the peoples and you indigenous people, you are taking part also on the panel. No, but how is going to work on the ground? How we can take part at the process when you are implementing like uh, the palm wheels or coffee to do not destroy this land. So you need to inc include like indigenous peoples at the beginning and the government taking the decisions for the national laws. They need to take indigenous people, women, all the peoples from the beginning of the process to write down those ones. And as, you, as well as the implementing agency as UN or uh, other NGOs who can take us in the board from the beginning and that we can successfully run this partnership and win our objective to protect the mothers. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, it sounds to me um, that that 5P might need to be a 6P um, with production, protection, uh, public, private and people partnerships um, to take account of this important dimension. <laughs> But um, um, Hindu, as just as a as, as a follow up, I mean, do, do you sense um, a kind of a movement in the agenda now that this partnership idea, collaboration, if we can ensure that um, uh, indigenous peoples and the smallholders at the centre of those partnerships, as the governor was explaining, c can you sense that we're into a, a, a new stage of implementation? We're searching for good examples mm -hmm. of those which others can can replicate. I'm seeing this movement going through the TFA 2020, who is the platform of partnership, showing that and giving the same place and chance of private sector, civil society, indigenous peoples, and uh, also the UNs, all the peoples coming together through this platform and discussing the important issues, how we can do to achieve the goal by 2020. But we need to be clear, 2020 is just of four years. Yeah. And is it four years we are going to do that at the international level? And this is the role that playing the TFA 2020 at the local level and the regional level of the implementation and seeing what each of these partners are doing on the ground and how they can convert and take the same trajectory to improve it. And that indigenous people asking, well, but our rights are not respected. How it's going to be? Then the private sector come, okay, well, let us do that together and the government to help implementations. I think this is the best example that I do have. We need to get more in board 
uh, more maybe indigenous peoples to come there and see how it can be organized at the regional level to take it to the ground where the projects are happening and where the impact on the deforestation are happening. That's extremely interesting. So you're referring to the fact that um, on, on the back of um, a desire for the kind of new wave of Red Plus commitments to have that strategic intent to work with the private as well as the public, um, the international community, the GEF, looking at um, where systemically, rather than just lots of projects, kind of support can be made, where there's increasing interest from, at the sub-national level, these development, these production protection partnerships, that some collaborative platforms do exist. I think you mentioned the Tropical Forest Alliance uh, uh, 2020, but within that machinery to identify good examples um, and more examples of how this can actually work. Um, Jonathan, if you hold that thought for a second, I have just one more question, Ibrahim, if I, if I, if, if, if I may, uh, Hindu, because um, uh, one of the slides that came up earlier was about the land tenure um, issue. And I know this is, I mean, uh, as far as I understand, quite, a, quite a, a complex but important issue for indigenous peoples. We're talking almost, you know, quite enthusiastically about collaborations and partnerships. Do you think, from your experience, the land tenure thing has to be sorted first before these exercises and collaborations can happen? Or is it possible to do them at the same time? Or is it so complicated that we'll all have to go to a, a breakout group and discuss this in more depth? <laughs> I mean, yeah, actually, when we saw that, land tenure is really very important. And, you know, let me take the example on African countries and especially where I come from. When we talk about the land, it's really a very huge issue. In most of the constitution you see, uh, they have land territories It's for the government. And there is something they put, like they recognize a customary laws. So it's really not clear. So the land tenure issues is very important, not only in Africa and around all the world. We need to clarify that because why as indigenous peoples, we do have that orally and we do have that in our customer law that the land tenure is very important for us and the recognition of the global land for communities is really very important. So we need to put that clear into, into the into the documents and to see we can put the land tenures as priority and the partnership can help how they can achieve the land tenure issues. Oh, yeah, then that can work really ah. better because uh, the, the government need to understand about the land tenure issues. Like, yes, if I do not, I do not hold the land, what I have. But yes, you have all because you have the country. But we, you need to define how to protect this country to say, I'm the government there, then I am the president there. And for the private sector, if you do not have the land tenure issues, the conflict can grow up. So you need to define that clear. And indigenous peoples can know this is the land, uh, the land we hold, and we need to protect it more because we have it. Not to just to say, it's my land, I own it, because you cannot take it in your head and move with it. So that's the issue. Oh, that's interesting. There's a very interesting insight there that you can actually use some of these collaborative approaches to help um, engage in the dialogue about the, the, the land tenure, tenure piece. Fascinating. Thank you. Um, Jonathan Horrell, so you're director, Mondelez International, um, and um, uh, you know, you've heard quite an interesting uh, kind of range of, of, of thought here on the movement of this agenda around alliances and collaborations and protection, production, public-private people partnerships. Um, um, a couple of questions um, for, for, for you, um, because uh, Mondelez International is is, is one of the leaders in, in building out and, and, and delivering on these things. First of all, kind of why? You know, I mean, you're a big company. I mean, you don't need to, this all sounds terribly complicated. I mean, wh why, why do you engage um, in, this, in this space? If I can say so, such excellent results, but why, why do you do it? Thanks, uh, thanks. so morning, everyone. Um, I, 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 was, I had the pleasure of being here at the last conference, uh, which I, in what I thought was October 2014, uh, so I'm thrilled to be invited back, of course. Uh, I'm slightly disconcerted that I seem to have lost a year because I discovered it was from Francis this morning. It was actually in 2013. But anyway, while well, I try and piece together that missing 12 months. Uh, 
modern day international is a, a global business. We're, we focus on snacks. Uh, and that means, in, in practice, we're the world's biggest biscuit maker and the world's biggest chocolate maker. That means we source a lot of food commodities, uh, raw materials uh, for our products. Uh, many of those, of course, from tropical countries. Uh, that means we are inherently bound up in the climate change debate because we depend on the climate system for our future survival as a company. Like any food business, climate change is, is, is existential. Uh, it's very long term and that's a challenge for us. But you know, we, we approach, therefore, sustainability with climate change at the core of it. Now, we can control, we have operations ourselves that we can control directly. And so, for our manufacturing operations, we have a goal for CO2 emissions reduction up to 2020, which is built around this emerged, newly emerging methodology around science-based targets. So we can, we can take what's in our own direct control, and the theory is that we'll reduce our emissions in line with, if you like, the trajectory required for two degrees. So we confirmed that target late last year in a run-up to COP. But if you look at our end-to-end uh, -end climate footprint, well, when, I, when, when I look at those data, and something like it, I think, is due to be published quite shortly, so you can see this, the biggest single impact on our end-to-end -end carbon footprint is deforestation in our raw material supply chain. Biggest single item. Within that, the biggest contributing raw materials are palm oil, well, I guess no one's surprised by that, and cocoa. So cocoa is more interesting. We've started now to say this. Um, why is cocoa such a contributor to deforestation? Well, actually, it's productivity that's the reason. Because if you look at the productivity graphs for cocoa, they've been pretty much flat for about 50 years. And think what's happened to the productivity of almost any other agricultural raw material that you can name. Uh, in cocoa, it's been stubbornly low. Uh, and that means, as the global chocolate business grows, because chocolate's popular, uh, uh, it's popular here, uh, it's popular. I should have mentioned that we, uh, we're in Norway, so I must mention Freya uh, chocolate, which is one of us. Um, but it, chocolate consumption grows not just in the developed markets, but is growing rapidly in emerging markets at the moment. So demand for cocoa is growing. As demand grows with flat productivity, there's only one way to go. It's a forest crop. You go further into the forest. So for us, cocoa and deforestation are intrinsically linked, and we need to deal with that. Um, so that is a, there's a why for you. Now, we're already very involved in cocoa because of the productivity challenge leads to an income challenge, which leads to a uh, supply security challenge. So we have farmers, it's overwhelmingly a smallholder crop, typically a hectare or two, typically a dollar a day in West Africa, in communities which have extremely poor social provision. So you have a demotivated cocoa farming sector with a next generation that's not interested, and productivity remaining stubbornly low, and concerns about security of supply, as well as all the socioeconomic challenges that those communities face, that as major buyers, clearly we have... Uh, if you like, a responsibility to seek to influence. So we're investing heavily in cocoa. We have a program called Cocoa Life. It's a $400 million commitment over 10 years up until 2022, investing across the range of challenges they face, economic through agricultural productivity and income, other forms of livelihood, women's empowerment and community development, youth, and of course, environment. So we're investing in multi-stakeholder partnerships, working with governments, working with NGO partners, social and environmental NGOs, working with UNDP for implementation, um, and others uh, in six origin countries, notably in West Africa. Côte d'Ivoire and Ghana are the two major cocoa origins. I'm sure many people know that. So, that's what, so we're already invested in cocoa, but then we, 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 we put over the top of it this climate change challenge and the fact that the data show that cocoa is a major driver. Now, when I came here two years ago, through a series of what you might regard as unfortunate events, I found myself up on the platform here talking about Red Plus. And because I had the luxury of no preparation, I could just kind of say what came into my head. And the thing I said was that this idea, Red Plus, looks really interesting. There's something in this. Don't understand a word of what all you people are saying, <laughs> but you know, maybe we can think about it. Well, I'm pleased to say that through the interventions of one or two very, very smart people in our company and some extremely smart people in partners, including World Bank and, of course, obviously, uh, in Côte d'Ivoire itself. We were able to announce at the Lima Paris Action Agenda uh, sessions at COP um, a Red Plus deal with, uh, with the government of Côte d'Ivoire. 
Um, so what that means is we work with the ministry, uh, the environment ministry in Côte d'Ivoire. Uh, there is support from the UN Red Office, uh, which is uh, run by UNDP uh, in Côte d'Ivoire. Uh, we have a couple of NGO partners, uh, TFT, which will be known to many, and uh, an, an NGO called Impacta. Um, and the World Bank is in into this with uh, readiness funding um, and FIP funding for, for, for the resulting programs. We're mapping areas because cocoa is a forest crop. We're now investing in, through our Cocoa Life program, the area, actual communities, investing in productivity. We know where those communities are. We know where the farms are. We're mapping those farms against the areas of forest, which we're defining, uh, because no maps exist beyond, the, if you like, the national forests. So we're working uh, with, through, through the program to identify the areas of forest, be they existing protected forest, community forest, or other forms of valuable forest that we can protect through the program. And this is now happening, and it's, and it's a reality on the ground. So from my perspective, I think, you know, two or is it three years later, you know, we've actually translated something very strange and theoretical and complex uh, into something which matches okay. with a business case, and the business case for us is productivity, the business case for the people is income and livelihood. Um, uh, and then, if you like, then the broader case is forest protection. Um, and, and the two things go hand in hand. So your six Ps, I hope, almost. That's brilliant. Um, so um, this conversation could carry on and on and on, but we have to stop, unfortunately, because we're keeping people from the lunch that is out there. Um, but what you've just, I think, articulated um, there was two incredibly interesting insights. One, the productivity um, agenda, um, about how it works actually for all of the people along this panel, um, that that smallholder or that indigenous um, uh, uh, community farmer, the productivity increases and all kinds of um, positives spin from that. Um, but that stops the kind of spread into the, into the forest and has that very strong uh, socioeconomic um, um, impact and good for you. Um, which is often perhaps not what people think about when they think of a, a company. They might think, oh, it's sort of doing something that's just nice, you know, in, in, in the uh, shareholder report. It's a nice to, not a must. You're saying it's a must, um, given the kind of state of the economics of the market. Um, we have a minute and 22 left, and there's a, a gazillion questions that I would love to um, um, put through. I'm sure you are thinking them too. Um, these people will be out there um, milling around, also having lunch, so please do kind of follow up with them. But... I have to kind of ask a kind of a binary question um, to kind of close off our panel. Um, it, it seems to me um, that there um, may be momentum in this uh, 6P uh, um, uh, agenda um, to complement the Red Plus architecture that was built already. So if we were going to come back in two years, we might have even more of these examples. Um, so the question just around the panel, perhaps starting with you, Thomas, is your glass half full or half empty about the Red Plus agenda? Half full or half empty? Are you optimistic or doubtful? Politicians are always stamped to be optimists. There we go. So uh, for politicians, glasses are never half, half empty. Uh, hopefully a bit more than a half full. A, a bit more than a half full. But um, uh, what we will do now as next step is to... I'll take these national, nationally determined contributions as a methodology of assessing effectiveness. So we are preparing a new partnership on NDCs. We will launch it uh, in due time at the beginning of uh, July. And just a, a short uh, replication to, to your ideas. Uh, it, it's brilliant that you um, evaluate your own value chain under sustainability aspects. But what we want to see is that um, agriculture, forest management in developing countries is not restricted to uh, well, primary production and to the export of raw materials. So if we want to create a sustainable economic development, providing new jobs for fast-growing populations in many societies, it will be necessary to invest in a way that um, manufacturing and processing in the agricultural sector processing is uh, better implemented in uh, these societies. So this would be the next step. And this, of course, needs also some uh, mutual exchange and learning from each other. 
and uh, sustainability in supply chains will be a major issue for governments as well. We do it in the textile sector. We have a long-standing cooperation in the cocoa sector uh, on sustainable, sustainable production. Uh, we will extend it to public procurement, to many other sectors. Sustainability in supply chains will be a major issue of international partnerships and in, in included, uh, this will include deforestation-free supply chains. So we will have, from an, the perspective of industrialized countries, we will have to bring in uh, the consumer markets and the power and the interests of consumers who want to buy products that respect uh, sustainability standards economically, socially and ecologically. Brilliant. So I think that was half full. Uh, um, and that sounds like a quite a positive agenda brewing there, kind of almost, it's, it's like a self-reinforcing cycle here. You can see some innovations that come through and you can see how one can press further with the public policy, with the consumer piece and with other concessional financing um, through the supply chains. Um, you'll have to hold that thought about half full or half empty because there's a big red sign here that says our time is up. Um, can I just thank um, the panel um, and can you help me thank the panel for... <laughs>